I'm now delighted to introduce Jane Ozan, author, prominent evangelical member of the Synod of the Church of England, founder and director of the Ozan Foundation. Jane's work within the church to encourage love and acceptance for everyone, irrespective of sexuality, is an inspiration to many. Suffice it to say that um, Jane's message has not been universally welcomed within the church, and I hope we can give her a good welcome as she speaks about the abusive practice of gay conversion therapy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try and speak um, from this angle. I know it's not going to be ideal for your cameraman, but uh, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to that. Thank you so much for inviting me. I, I have to be honest and say, um, A, it's wonderful to speak to what I think is a pretty welcoming audience on this topic, but more importantly, I myself need to apologise for, uh, I think, misconceptions that I, like many Christians, have of what the secular society is all about. And actually, just even in, in our opening speech, Anthony, I find myself agreeing 100% with everything that you said <laughs> and recognising that there are still prejudices and discrimination that I hold that I need to be honest about. So thank you for an education this morning. Um, conversion therapy. I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour. This will be a topic that some of you may know a lot about and some of you have never come across. So I'm going to try and um, find a way through that in the time that we've got. Let's see if this is... Go oh, that's a good start, isn't it? Hang on. Um, anybody know which one I need to press? Please. Okay. So, um, we're, we're, we're briefly going to give you, a, a, I suppose, a basic guide of what is gay conversion therapy, why do Christians, LGBTI Christians, and I'm going to talk about the Christian faith. This could be applied to any other faith, but it's the Christian faith that I know most about, um, and I don't want to assume that I know about my colleagues from other faiths, but if you have experience of that, please do tell me. A lot of this does map, but there are a lot of more cultural issues involved often with um, my Muslim, Hindu and Jewish friends than perhaps uh, that we always find in the Christian faith. How common is gay conversion therapy? Um, that's something we're still trying to ascertain, but I will give you some of the figures that we're currently aware of. Uh, what is the impact on the individual what's been done to stop it, and perhaps most importantly, what of the future, where do we go from here? And I'll try and do that in half an hour, but do give me um, um, some warnings, uh, um, if we may. So what is gay conversion therapy? So conversion therapy has got various names, depending which part of the Atlantic, or indeed which part of a church you're in, you'll know it as reparative therapy, um, sexual reorientation therapy, and it's generally designed, as has already been pointed out, to move someone in one direction from frankly being uh, gay to being straight. I have yet to find anybody who's tried to go the opposite way. If you have uh, come across that, I'd love to interview them and get some... Uh, but I, I, I think it's obviously about trying to condition yourself to a set of beliefs that changes your intimate desires. And it's an umbrella term that frankly can be used uh, to, to talk about a number of practices Typically, talking therapies, prayer, uh, I've known of hypnosis and aversion therapy still in practice, like electronic shock treatments where you're shown various uh, pictures, normally pornography, and then you're given a shock to try and make yourself um, hate that rubber band technology. I've heard of um, much more physically violent forms of aversion therapy that are uh, sadly being practiced on young people um, in, in, in certain communities uh, in Scotland where they're whipped. Um, deliverance ministry, which I myself has been through and I talk about a lot in my book, which if you're interested in hearing a more personal journey on this is on sale. That's a terrible plug, isn't it? But I have brought <laughs> some with me. And sadly, corrective rape therapy. Um, I remember when I announced this in a paper for the Church of England's debate last year on conversion therapy was asked to take this out because there was evidently no proof. And I said, well, actually, there's lots of proof. We've heard individual testimonies of women in particular uh, being sent home to Africa where they are gang raped in order to make them straight. I'm not aware of that happening in the geographical presence of the UK, but I do know of many young people 
uh, sadly, who've been threatened with that, um, or rather I've heard of people uh, who charities I'm involved with have, have uh, taken their testimonies, and it's the number one reason for the very high level of homelessness amongst LGBTI youth that we have in London. Many young people feel the only option they have is to run away from home. I tend to talk about conversion therapy in three phases. Um, I, uh, there is a study that was done in the States, which I'll come on to, which uh, verifies this, and I myself am trying to do a similar study in the next two months. But typically, not everybody, but typically most of us will go through three phases. The first is what I call the silent confusion and plea bargaining uh, private phase, where it is literally a matter between you and God. You struggle uh, sadly on your own, feeling often that you are the only person going through the hell that you're in. Um, often, as a, I'm talking as, a, as someone of faith here, um, asking the question, why, if God loves me, has he or she created me in this way? And uh, then actually asking, what, what will acting on this desire actually bring me the, the love and hope that I yearn for? That was the question that racked my mind more than anything. I knew I was attracted to women, but actually I didn't know um, whether that, that longing, that desire was a, a, a good, fruitful one. Would it, would it just evaporate the moment that I acted on it? Was it, in a sense, being sent by the devil to trust me? And the risk of trying to answer that question was so high, I couldn't, if you like, go there. So I was racked with this not knowing. Um, how do I satisfy this deep desire for love and intimacy if I can never be in a relationship? That longing for love, that longing for uh, being known and being desired um, and being told that I had to be celibate for life. It's a, it's a hell of a prison to put someone through. And for many of us, it can last 20, 30 years or even a lifetime. Many people never come out of this phase. They never feel they can talk about it to anyone because the cost of, of doing so is so high. To actually name that, that internal yearning to friends and family around you um, if you live in a very religious context means that you will Im immediately be put on what's called the unsound step um, and that you can never unsay those words. So many people will just stay in this hell. Now, I have to be honest and say that the advent of the internet has been a lifeline to so many. Now, um, I'm aware of various organisations which uh, young people can, can, can join, like Diverse Church, which weren't around in the 80s and 90s when I was going through this hell. And I hope and pray that most young people who are stuck in this phase can actually find the support they need online. But more often than not, at some point, due to some form of crisis, uh, phase two will kick in and you will seek to talk to somebody you trust, uh, often a friend who will then immediately refer you to a church leader for prayer. And um, this is the sort of good, good um, do good a phrase, if you like. Lots of people who love you dearly want to see you healed and believe that it's just a matter of a bit of prayer. And so you will be sent uh, for a prayer ministry with uh, people in your church uh, who will often use their understanding of God's healing power to um, pray into your emotional well-being. There is a lot of belief that you must be, being, must be having these uh, uh, desires and attractions because of something that's happened to you, um, be it a, 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 an unbalanced relationship with one of your parents perhaps or something that might have happened to you in terms of a physical sexual relationship with someone which wasn't wholesome. So you find yourself unburdening every dark secret, every little intimate encounter that you might have had uh, to people who you hardly know on the basis that you hope it uh, will give them a, a revelation as to what is the cause of your illness. And that uh, phase can go on for many years and sadly again it leaves the victim, and I call them victims because I do see this as abuse, feeling terribly guilty that the prayer isn't working. Though no matter how much they try, how much they um, if you like, fast and pray and, and make themselves vulnerable, they constantly still, or I constantly still, had those feelings and, and, and felt a failure as a result and felt a lot of shame. And so ultimately, normally you move into the more dangerous phase, as I call it, the, the third phase of actually seeking deliverance ministry, which 
typically for me is what I would call conversion therapy. These are ministries that exist where you often pay uh, or ask to give a donation because it's this person's life work, uh, who will go through some form of, of specialist prayer ministry with you. Um, and that can, gosh, I could spend the next hour talking about that, but that can, that can be based on all sorts of um, unusual beliefs that that person might have about uh, generational spirits, about Freemasonry, about the spirit of homosexuality or lust or anger. Everybody's got their own, if you like, um, belief structure and they will pray into that. It may sound very strange. I'm an Oxford and Cambridge educated woman. I've had a visiting research professorship at Oxford. Forgive me, I don't say that to boast, but I to say that to say that this woman still went through all this because that is how strongly I believed I was being called to do that. And the truth is, it's not um, just the vulnerable, uneducated who go through this. It's many in our society who silently go through this um, because they truly believe that's what their religion calls them to do. I did it voluntarily and it caused me absolute immense harm. I ended up in hospital twice with my body packing up, fighting for life um, and then having two very uh, serious breakdowns and it was after the second of those breakdowns I decided that if I actually wanted to continue living I had to face the fear of coming out and the ostracism of feeling that I, I had to walk away from God. Uh, that's what I believed, um, and found happiness in a wonderful relationship with a woman, and then realised that the God I, I believed in was still very much present in my life, and that story is what my book unpacks and explains why I'm so um, passionate, if you like, about trying to ensure that the hell I went through is not one that any other young or not so young person has to go through again. Um, I mentioned earlier a research study that has been done. It's probably the world's largest study on LGBTQ or same-sex attracted, as often um, people within a conservative Christian, or in this case Mormon setting, are called. Over 1,600 respondents uh, to this American study called the Delaney Study uh, talked about the impact of their faith as, as Mormons on their um, on their decision to come out or not come out, to get married to someone of the opposite sex and hope for the best, or to uh, leave their faith or to go through forms of ministry. If you're interested in it, um, I've created a bit.ly, bit.ly, a short code of Science Theology Conference. Uh, this paper was given at Durham University two years ago, and it's a fascinating study. And I'm going to pull out just a few findings uh, for this morning, but frankly, they're too, it's too detailed to go into too much detail, and you won't be able to see this slide very well. But basically, Delaney asked um, uh, his 1,600 respondents, what different types of sexual orientation change therapy did you try? And the three most prevalent, the ones at the top, were personal righteousness, and what he means by that is, is sort of plea bargaining with God, saying that you will be as good as you possibly can, I don't know, giving away a tenth of your money, doing uh, good turns, anything that allows you to feel that you're in a right position with God and begging him therefore to heal you. Um, it puts an awful lot of pressure on the individual, but 78% uh, tried that. Other individual effort that could just be when you're holding it on your own, and then church counselling, which shows, if you like, that movement through. But psychotherapy, support groups, group therapy, group retreats. There were people going to um, uh, hospital, sorry, psychotherapists and psychiatrists, and we'll come on to that in a minute. But most of this was done within the church. So why do Christian, why does someone like me consent to going through this? I'm not going to deal with people who don't consent, although arguably there are a lot of young people who are forced, who are given no choice. I'm afraid I haven't got statistics on that. I'm trying to get that sort of information. But why does an adult like me consent to going through this? And, and I call it the circle that can never be squared. You're taught uh, from a very early age that the Bible is clear. That phrase, which, oh gosh, if I could have a penny for every time I hear it, I would be a multi-billionaire right now. But the Bible is clear that homosexuality is a sin. And it's based on, um, I'm, I'm just going to give you three, but it's based on six verses in the, in the Bible. Uh, six of, of, of literally millions of verses. 
Uh, one that's from Leviticus that talks about, um, uh, it's not even <coughs> homosexuality, it talks about anal sex being an omin- abomination. Um, in, in Romans, uh, uh, the, the letter to the Romans from St. Paul, he talks about the fact that homosexuals, uh, in inverted commas, will go to hell. hell. Uh, arguably, actually, that's not actually what he said. In the Greek, he talks about uh, a word which we have never really got to the bottom of understanding what it means. Um, it, I think the closest understanding is to talk about male prostitutes, but the concept of homosexuality was certainly uh, not a, a phrase that would have been used in the New Testament. Um, and back in Genesis, there is a belief uh, that many Christians hold that God made us purely male and female. Um, the whole uh, um, uh, the whole understanding of intersex was not something that many Christians understand at all, and it's something I'm trying to do a lot about helping them become far more aware about, because I think understanding that we aren't just male and female is a key to this um, quite difficult conundrum. But you're taught that sex is only for marriage, and marriage is only for a man and a woman. And so therefore, frankly, if you're gay, then you're stuffed, because ultimately you can never be married, and because sex is only for marriage, you can never have a relationship. And so either you have to be celibate for life, or you need to get married in faith to someone of the opposite sex and just hope for the best. Now, most young people being taught that know that that is going to give them a lifetime of, 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 of great sadness, anxiety, and depression, And so they will do anything to try and become straight. And it's that impetus, certainly my impetus, which is why I put myself through all the conversion therapy I could. (coughs) This is quite a heavy slide, Um, but it's just to name. There is an umbrella organisation called the Evangelical Alliance. Some of you may have heard of it. It claims to uh, represent hundreds of organisations, thousands of churches and tens of thousands of people. And uh, a few years ago, they put out a statement um, called the Evangelical Alliance Affirmations, which is teaching all those churches and individuals how to treat um, people who suffer from same-sex attraction. And it's been endorsed by the Evangelical Group on the General Synod, so within the, the, if you like, the senior hierarchy of evangelicals. And this is something they still believe today. But it basically explains the problem that people like myself have. There are the ten affirmations, and I'm just going to read you parts from the last two. The first one, uh, part, well, part nine, talks about um, uh, the fact they believe that both habitual homoerotic sexual activity without repentance and public promotion of such act- activity are inconsistent with faithful church membership, and therefore that person should be disciplined, i.e. if you're in a same-sex relationship and it's sexual, or if you believe that someone should be able to have a same-sex relationship, then you should be subject to church discipline, which normally means being put out of the church. And then the final piece, which is the most dangerous, and actually people don't often get to the tenth affirmation because they've given up by then, but the tenth affirmation talks about the fact that we are expected to be transformed and that we should renounce our same-sex relations. So it's a code for we should be transformed, we should be changed, we should be converted to being straight. So even today there is a a belief and a promoted belief amongst many within the Evangelical Alliance that conversion therapy is the only true way of of, of dealing with someone who's suffering from same-sex attraction. Uh, the consequences are coming out. Um, yeah, gosh, the consequences of anybody coming out are very severe. They will lose all their friends and family, which is what I, I experienced. Uh, but more importantly, they're often asked to stand down from any form of leadership. Um, they, I've known of people who've had letters sent to all the churches near them to be told, don't let this person in your church. They're in the same sex relationship. Um, and they're often asked um, to leave as I've already said, their church, if there is no repentance, which means that at a point of great vulnerability, at a point of just coming to terms with your sexuality, you lose the, um, the network of friends, the support that you have grown up with, and you're on your own. And that is a, a step too much for most people, so that is also why they go through conversion therapy. I know this, this is probably slightly off topic for you, because I know you want to focus on, on healthcare, 
but I'm just trying to give you a glimpse as to the hell that so many young, young people are going through and why they will seek uh, the, the sort of therapy that um, this has been. I did a, uh, a brief survey last year, which I'm actually repeating in far more depth, so that's why I haven't published the results, but it gives you an indication. I, I asked, uh, I did a survey monkey online and I, amongst the LGBTQ community, um, Christian community, and I asked how many people had gone through conversion therapy. And 219 of the 800 plus responses I got, so nearly a quarter had gone through some form of conversion therapy. Oh dear. Um, and the vast majority did so because they thought it was sinful. Gosh, that time went quickly. So how common is it? Well, um, the government did a survey uh, last year, 108,000 responses, one of the biggest response rates amongst the LGBT, and 5% of respondents said they'd been offered conversion therapy, hadn't taken up, 2% had gone through it, and interestingly, 51% of those who'd gone through it had been conducted by faith groups. The government were astonished by these results. Um, I was relieved, many of us have been telling the government for some time that this was a massive issue, but they just thought it was for a couple of individuals. They suddenly realised that this was um, affecting thousands, and therefore they came through with a plan, which I will have to skip through, but a, a, an LGBT action pet. Um, plan which has announced that they do want to ban conversion therapy. In that, um, yeah, this is this is the slide that shows that faith organisations uh, were the main source of conversion therapy. They also um, had Stonewall had done a, uh, a piece of research um, back in 2015 amongst healthcare workers that asked um, various questions about attitudes to the LGBTQ community. And they picked up, much to their surprise, that 10% of healthcare workers uh, with direct responsibilities for patient care had witnessed staff in their workplace express the belief that someone can be cured. And this rose to 22% in London. So these are people within the healthcare system, uh, be they nurses, GPs, surgeons, doctors, who believe that healthcare um, practices, that, that people's sexual orientation could be cured. And that was being promoted actively in many hospitals on, on work notice boards. In my survey that I did, I asked um, how old people were when they went through it. And this is quite key because uh, if nearly half were under 17, 75% uh, under 20. That shows that we are dealing with vulnerable adults at a very young formative part of their life, which for me is why there is such an urgency on this topic. The impact, um, well, I think you probably, uh, you don't need me to go through this. The impact is horrendous. The level of self-harm, suicide, and um, frankly, uh, the, the actual impact on long-term uh, relationships is huge. There have been various studies on this. Again, if you go onto my website, you'll, you'll find a lot more information. Um, I'm conscious we don't have enough time uh, to go through all of it. But I, I think the important thing is that the church itself is beginning to recognise the damage it's doing. Steve Chalk who runs a very large Baptist church in central London, brought out a report last year uh, which showed that actually he was aware, as many of us are, but it's the church's attitude to sexuality that is causing so many people uh, to suffer self-harm, depression and suicide. And I think that, if you like, the direct, indirect impact of conversion therapy has, has caused far greater harm than we will ever truly know. This isn't working quite as well as I hoped it would. Let's just try and go back. Um, horrible statistics, you know, 44% of young LGBT people have considered suicide. 52% of young LGBT people will report self-harm either now or in the past. And that is because of discrimination and prejudice in society, which stems traditionally from religious belief, and I know that's why we need to change the things that we do. Sorry to go through. So what is being done to stop gay conversion therapy? I have to be honest, the government has done an extraordinary amount of work with the healthcare system. In 2014, they put together a consortium, and in 2015, they brought out a memorandum of understanding that is signed by 17 organisations from the General Medical Council through to the NHS, to the uh, Royal College of Psychiatrists, psychotherapists, you can Google it, virtually every healthcare uh, profession. 
that agreed that um, sexual orientation, uh, that being gay is not an illness and that uh, these therapies are unethical and potentially harmful. And that work, they thought, the government, was enough. They thought that would be um, the best way of, of stopping this practice. But the truth is, I knew, and many others did, that actually the practice was going on within religious uh, context, that the threat wasn't actually from trained healthcare workers, the threat was actually from churches or Muslim, um, faith groups who were trying to practice this. So um, I, I won't do that. I, I basically put together a whole load of science uh, briefings for the church. Um, Professor Michael King, I've worked very closely with, who's the chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists Special Interest Group on Sexuality. Um, helped me put together a, a series of lectures, scienceandsexuality.com will take you to them. An un, un, unreserved plug, I've got another conference coming up in December if this is something you're interested in getting facts with some of the top academics talking about sexuality and then there's trying to look at how we take that understanding of what it is to be human and apply that to faith. But perhaps the key thing was the fact that last year the Church of England did endorse a private member's motion that I brought to them which endorsed that memorandum of understanding and said that conversion therapy should be banned. That was key um, to the government. Ben Bradshaw worked with me to, to, to ensure that we got to talk to the government through Caroline Spellman, the Second Estates Commissioner, to ask that we did reconsider the ban. And uh, as some of you may know, uh, earlier this year, the government brought out an LGBT action plan. And one of those 75 points was a commitment to ban conversion therapy. And that is something I'm working with the government now to do. Um, we need to work out how we make that happen. Uh, we recognise it's not just medical professions. It's actually, sadly, a lot of well-meaning but ill-informed individuals and we have to find a way of making that criminal and I'm, I'm glad to say that I know the government is very determined to do that. Thank you.